Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and finance. This week, direct from the World Petroleum Congress here in Doha. Coming up, the inside word on the energy industry as $100 oil prices become a new reality. Also, the headline interviews with Royal Dutch Shell and Brazil's Petrobras. And a look inside the oil and gas industry's biggest gathering as it comes to the Middle East for the first time. So welcome to Doha everyone, out of the studio this week and instead outside this magnificent new structure, the Qatar National Convention Centre for the World Petroleum Congress, an event on an enormous scale now into its 20th edition and coming here uh, to Doha for that 20th edition. Great chance for us to really find out what is making this industry tick right now. We're talking oil and gas, renewable energies as well. And to find out how this continuing economic downturn all over the world is affecting the industry and its major players. Coming up, some of those major players talk to us here on Counting the Cost, the likes of Peter Vossa, the CEO of Royal Dutch Shell, also Sergio Gabrielli from Brazil's Petrobras, and Gunther Oettinger, who is the EU's Commissioner for Energy. Good to get his thoughts at this time of upheaval for Europe and more specifically the Eurozone. That is all to come on the program. Right now, though, we're going to go inside the convention centre to find out what makes an event like this tick. So the World Petroleum Congress, in its almost 80 years of existence, it has never been held in the Middle East for Jubilee. So it's a big deal for Doha that it is being held here over the next five days. What is it, essentially? About 5,000 delegates from all over the world, right across the oil and gas sector, discussing the biggest issues in the industry today, which I'll admit may not sound that interesting. And certainly there's some pretty big, uninteresting looking doors here at the National Convention Center. But it is what on the other side of those doors which is interesting. Straight away you see the big companies, the likes of BP or Beyond Petroleum as they like to say with their logo or slogan these days. Total's here as well with a Lotus Renault Formula One car reminding us of the big tie-ups between the big oil companies and things like sports and sponsorship. But it's also interesting to see who else is here. The Chinese National Committee. You've got Colombia here as well, a big crowd gathering around the Colombians at the moment. Next to them is Angola and there's India as well. So it gives you an idea of the developing, the emerging countries that are here looking for the big deals. Remember, these are the places where the oil is and the gas is a lot of the time. They're looking to see what opportunities are available to them here. Certainly that's what John Ovandas told us a bit earlier. He's an oil and gas analyst with Ernst & Young. Well, you know, we just had a session uh, during uh, Africa Oil and Gas Week in Cape Town a few weeks ago. Uh, just looking at the, uh, you know, the companies attending now there, uh, the excellent opportunities uh, in the Gulf of Guinea, and uh, not to talk about the East Africa. So East Africa is coming on the map, and we can see some significant opportunities coming in there. And you know, looks like all the majors and some of the uh, mid-sized companies are moving in there fast right now. So an analytical point of view for you there, but being at something like World Petroleum Congress does give us the chance to get the inside industry view. And we're going to start that off with actually one of the biggest players, 3.3 uh, million barrels of oil a day, 93,000 employees, 90 plus countries around the world. We're talking Royal Dutch Shell and its CEO is Peter Vossa. The oil business then, broadly speaking, how is it going? We've, we've got higher prices at the moment. Uh, we've got generally fighting negative press about oil. You get incidents which happen like which happened to BP in, in the Gulf of Mexico. How do you grow the oil business and, and fight the, the preconceptions about it? Yeah, I think the, the world will need uh, the oil business. Yes, indeed, from a reputation point of view, I think we have to do more. We have to be very transparent in the way we do our business, the way we take our risks and how we manage our risks. I think from that point of view the Macondo incident was a, was a good learning. Um, it, it, I think it became clearer to society that this is not a risk-free free, free business. So avoiding accidents for us has, be, has to be an absolute well, key. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Did you stop after what happened at Deepwater Horizon? Did you stop and really take stock of the situation and look long and hard at your own safety? Uh, systems that are in place. There are two answers here. Uh, I think immediately after the, the accident we clearly checked worldwide all of our um, wells uh, to see if we have got um, similar issues and we didn't find them so from that point of view um, we did the check and it was okay. 
2000, in 2007, when we went back big time into deep water, we actually completely um, reassessed our risks and our safety and our technologies to go to deep water. And there we developed global policies, global safety, global technology, um, and with that actually we were very well positioned going into the crisis of Macondo. And what you actually have seen the Americans now kind of issuing in terms of new policies, this is more or less something which we had already in place. So we were well prepared for that and where we actually as an industry where we weren't that much prepared which is in the containment of the spill we immediately reacted together with uh, ConocoPhillips, Chevron and Exxon and we put a billion dollars on the table in order to actually build a new containment system but purely from a shell perspective we were well prepared uh, to this because we are constantly reviewing our risk strategies. A quick thought on the $100 a barrel uh, here to stay? I think we said in the longer term prices will stay high because uh, costs are going up, the resources to develop are more complex, hence you need more technology. Um, the, the demand is most probably going to outpace supply given the fast demand uh, increase which we see in the, in the longer term. Um, we internally, we look at our uh, projects in a 50 to 90 dollar price range. Okay. And um, because we are a long-term in industry, so we want to be on the conservative safe side. And uh, I think that's how we look at the world. So we think in that range and at the prices today, our projects will be developed because they actually are uh, profitable. Okay, let's look at some, uh, some wider issues, not perhaps specifically to do with energy or with Royal Dutch Shell, but, but they affect you surely. Uh, Europe is, is the obvious one. This week we saw Standard & Poor's put every country in the Eurozone on a negative watch, which is a pretty serious move. Perhaps it was always coming, but it is still a serious move. How does all this affect your business through Europe? Short-term economic uncertainties normally do not drive our long-term strategy. This is not short-term though, is it? And this yeah, no, is no, and, no. And it's, me, it's that's very why, wide. That's why yeah. I say it has okay. two components. Okay. So we will not change our strategy because of the uncertainties around us at this stage. We keep focusing spending around 30 billion dollars every year in terms of um, capital investments because we we need to deliver the energy to the world so that's the strategy part now the more fundamental part in europe is all about competitiveness of europe and therefore we have got a, a euro crisis we have a debt crisis and i think we also have a, a gross economic crisis at this stage and this needs fast very decisive political actions and I think whilst we have all been surprised about the pace how this came uh, at us over the last few months I think it's now about really the ultimate moment for the polit politicians to take the right decisions. The right decisions are clearly um, discipline on, on budgets, it is a monitoring system in a certain way about um, if countries are not performing but it is also revitalizing the European markets, which are 500 million consumers. We have been historically been very competitive in innovation manufacturing and we are about to lose some of that because we also get over-regulated in many areas. So I think it's, it needs a fundamental reshift in the thinking of how Europe can remain competitive in the longer term. Are you confident the euro currency itself and the eurozone idea can survive this? Because if it doesn't, a, a huge company like you, with markets all through Europe, everything will change. You'll have this system you know, groaning and creaking its way back towards old currencies. Everything will change. How, how would you deal with it? It is an absolute must to actually make sure that the euro survives. I think the, pol the politicians in Europe have no other chance. And I hope that the, the urgency is now clear and uh, we get decisive actions. You may have seen last week, together with four of my colleagues, we published a letter, a very open letter, where we urged the governments to actually now take decisive um, uh, actions so that we actually, as big European global companies, we can further develop the competitiveness of, of Europe. But our base assumption is that we will get this fixed and we will move forward. I, I just do not think at this stage that the other path is actually a violent path to go down. How does this affect the way you operate your business? I know that's a, a really broad question.
question, but you're operating in a difficult economic environment, and then you have to take into account all these smaller, but no less significant regional issues in the markets you operate in. This is about how you kind of um, have the communication with society, how you operate with your communities in which, in which you are actually doing your business. And that's becoming, I think, a very um, day-to-day -day job and it's becoming also a challenging job. Because in today's world where transparency is key, news are available, information are available, this forces us also to be very open and uh, be very transparent. And I think actually this suits Shell very well. We are very, uh, a very localized company, very strong where we normally operate. We have a very transparent way on sustainability issue, inclusion of communities. And I think there will be more of that needs to be done in the future. Well, one way you can do that, and this is sort of a final thought, seeing as you talk about the future, and that's your renewable energies. Again, we call this a World Petroleum Congress, but you look around everywhere here, renewable energies is a big deal. Do you think, though, the people, your consumers and your customers, believe that you, Royal Dutch Shell, a quote-unquote big oil company, is, is serious about renewable energy? No, I, I don't think so that we are already there. But I think, let's go back to what I said earlier, we need all the energies being developed. So this is not only a renewables, this is about making our current energy system um, into a, an energy system which has a low, lower carbon footprint. So whilst we are working on the re renewables, and it could be solar, it could be wind, it could be uh, hydrogen, or whatever new forms of energy we are thinking about, we also need to focus on making the current energy sources, oil and gas, actually more acceptable. So have a lower carbon footprint. And that's where a lot of R&D from our side goes into, that we are actually, because we depend on them for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, or even longer, that we make also them more accept acceptable from a society or from an environmental point of view. And I think that's the, the, the transparency, the trust issue, which we still have to bridge. Peter Vosset, it's a pleasure okay. to meet you. Thank, Thank you for your time. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Peter Vossel there from Royal Dutch Shell and he talked a lot didn't he about natural gas that side of the business which is increasingly becoming a big part of the energy sector. Not without its controversy though and what it is it's the issue of drilling the actual exploration for the natural gas which causes the controversy. I'm going to take you away from Doha just for a moment to the United States actually where Kristen Salumi has this case study on the issue of fracking. The Omegang brewery produces award-winning Belgian style beers. The main ingredient water. The brewery uses nearly 4 million liters a year, untreated from wells on their property in upstate New York. Ask any brewer and they will tell you that beer depends on four simple ingredients and the most important of those is water. That's why President Simon Thorpe has joined efforts to ban a controversial form of gas drilling, known as hydraulic fracturing or fracking. There is a growing understanding of the potential dangers of what the process could do not only to the environment but to business. Natural gas companies have been buying up the right to drill on local farmland. You're only hearing one side of the story. Like many local farmers, Jennifer Huntington could use the extra money. And so some may not really understand all that's involved and the work that goes into involved in the amount of money and capital to keeping this area beautiful and green, which is farmers is what we do. The fracking process involves drilling down vertically and then horizontally. Millions of liters of water are mixed with an undisclosed list of chemicals and sand, all of it then pumped down into the well to fracture the rock and release the gas. Whoa, Jesus Christ. Dramatic footage like this, as well as anecdotal evidence of mysterious illnesses, have galvanized opponents. Our water was good before they started drilling. Even though the Department of Environmental Conservation says there's no proof of any well being contaminated by fracking. The gas industry has been lobbying New York State to lift a moratorium on the process. We believe there's a, an enormous amount of gas here. It will also, uh, most importantly to me, uh, provide for the economic sustainability of this area of our country. But even in a region that relies on its natural resources for tourism and other jobs, America's thirst for new energy sources will be hard to quench.
As far as marketing techniques go, we were pretty impressed by this one. It's pretty cool. It actually stands out from a lot of the others here at the Congress. The company behind it, though, is uh, Sasol, which is very much part of the natural gas story. It specializes in creating uh, petroleum and diesel products from natural gas, GTL, gas to liquids as it's known. So I spoke to senior group executive Leon Strauss just to get his views on this fracking debate. Yeah, look, fracking is an old technology, it's not new. I think it got a lot of attention of late as the amount of shale gas that's produced are increasing. I think it's very important that we do this in a sustainable way. And, uh, and I think they might, we must come up with the right policies and legislation and make people adhere to that. What do you but, mean about sustainable? Give me some examples there. What? I mean, we must, we must not have contamination. You know, we must uh, 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 make sure that we don't contaminate uh, the surface water. But that can be done. You know, shale gas is produced at 8,000 feet below the surface. Potable water sits 300 feet below the surface. So, so as long as people comply and do it in a sustainable way, we're very comfortable that it can be done. And uh, we're pretty sure that uh, the newcomers, the major players who are now also investing in shale gas, they will, they will do this in a, in a sustainable way. So you ask my take, uh, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Um, I think it gets a lot of uh, publicity and there could have been one or two incidents in the past, but uh, I haven't heard of any contamination uh, of, of any significant uh, uh, magnitude. You know, emerging markets are a big part of this Congress, emerging markets, emerging companies. And our next guest comes from a company that, well, technically falls under that banner, but you'd have to say Brazil's Petrobras, largest company in Latin America, probably goes beyond that. We spoke to the CEO of Petrobras, Sergio Gabrielli. If I was to broadly say, how's business? Very good. Really, we are, we are having very good results of our exploration in Brazil in the pre salt our uh, wells are working better than we expected. Our production, we have some delays in, in uh, delivery of some drilling rigs, but we are producing more than two million barrels a day today. We are expecting to increase our production and reach 4.9 million barrels a day by 2020. And we just is... finished raising uh, 1.8 billion euros in, in, in Europe and uh, 700 million uh, uh, sterlings in, in, in the UK, which is... Good. So this is all good enough to finance your $225 billion oh, not, investment over five years? Everything or, that we or put need. it this way, is it, are you on the right track? Um, because the, it's a very the, ambitious plan. Yes, we are in the right track. We need to, to raise uh, between 65, 67 and $91 billion in the five years period. Uh, if the price of oil is between $80 and $90, $95 per barrel, the price of oil is above that now. Uh, which means that we can adjust the amount of uh, debt that we need to raise. And right now we are doing pretty much what we had on, planned for 2011. And you would say $100 a barrel? I think it's going to be the price of oil is going to be above $100 a barrel uh, on average. We are going to have a very, a very big volatility because of the interest rates are very low worldwide and we have a very big capital in flights to the uh, oil market. You mentioned Europe there, raising money in Europe. How has this current to Eurozone crisis affected your business, has it? Well, I think the European crisis has not a big impact on our business right now because most of the growth in the demand of oil products is not coming from Europe in the last five years. Uh, actually, in the last five years, if you look at the numbers in Europe and in the US and Japan, the consumption of oil products is declining. However, if you look at the, the global demand of oil products, it's increasing mm. because China, India, Brazil, South Americans, and Africans are buying more oil products. Mm. But no knock-on effect just from general business confidence, general fears about exposure oh, to Europe? On, on, the, on the financing side, also I think that the most of the problem is not a liquidity problem, it's a, sel a selec selective bias towards be better projects. And the sovereigns have some problems to finance their own debt. That's the reason we could do a very successful transaction a week after the, the, for, the, the sovereign had problems in Europe. As a businessman in Brazil, what do you make of the Brazilian government or talk of the Brazilian government and indeed the other BRICS nations getting themselves more involved in Europe, uh, you know, contributing to the EFSF, the bailout fund, indirectly through the IMF? What do you make of Brazil getting involved that far into Europe's problems? I don't think that what the, the Brazilian government position, but I know that uh, we have a, now a positive relation with the IMF. And I think that we, we transform, uh, we change very much our position from a debt to country to a credit to country to the IMF, which is a very good transformation of our relationship with the international uh, financial system. 
I think that uh, the Brazilian position now on foreign reserves is very good, very solid. I think Brazilian economy is growing very, in a very sustainable way. We have a slowing, slowing of the growth process in 2011, and we have also accommodated the uh, inflation expectations. I think that perspective for Brazilian economy is very good, and for our business also is very good. Final thought on the Congress itself. Everyone's raving about it. It's the biggest in history, 5,000 delegates here. Do you get what you want out of something like this? People probably look at it and think with that number of people there, it's just a, a, a big talk fest. Do you, do you get well, something really positive the, out of it? That's the function of a Congress, you know, it's to come to talk and, and discuss it between but ourselves. Do you get something concrete out of it to take back to your shareholders, to your No, we, to we really don't expect from a Congress like that that it meets ever three years a concrete thing. We, meet, we want much more share ideas on things that are, are of general interest. And I think that there are, I would pinpoint, three main issues right now. One is what's going to happen in the short run in the world economy. The second thing I would say that is the safety issues on oil production. And the third thing is, is social awareness uh, on, on governance and social responsibility and the, the role of big oil companies worldwide. And I think this, those three top, topics are very, very much a topic of discussions here in the Congress. Fantastic talking to you, Mr. Okay. Gabrielli. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we talked to a lot of people here at the World Petroleum Congress on and off camera, and usually they've got something to say about Europe and the ongoing debt crisis there. We wanted to go a little further than that, though, and not look at Europe just through the debt prism, but as a big and often complicated energy marketplace. And we did that with Gunther Oettinger, who is the EU's Commissioner for Energy. How would you describe, when I use that phrase, energy security? How good would you say it is across the European Union? Because uh, you can talk about security for anything, food security, all these types of things, making sure that everyone has what they need and there are no shortfalls. How, almost a uh, percentage, how good would you say the energy security is in the European Union? In last decades, we had um, no problems with energy um, imports. In 1973, there was the oil crisis. Mm -hmm. And since this time, we developed good relations mm. with the OPEC states and with OPEC in Vienna, with Russia directly, with Algeria, with Norway, with others. But you yeah. mentioned Russia, and there is always tension there, isn't there? Every winter we come to this problem of uh, pipelines going through certain countries, possibly being cut off. If bills aren't paid, that affects the rest of, of Western Europe. There's still a tension there, isn't there? I think all have learned from the January 2009 uh, damage mm. uh, and nobody has an interest to repeat this crisis not the Ukraine as a transit country getting fee for transit not Russia um, uh, their interest is to have a stable gas market in the European Union for long term mm. and not European Union and our member states and so uh, we have a good bilateral early warning mechanism between Russia and EU and we have some trilaterals with Ukraine, Russia and the EU as well. And additionally, we have more storage capacity in the EU, more and more. And we diversified our um, sources and our routes. And at least importantly as well that we have new interconnectors for to bring solidarity from one member state to a neighbor state if it's needed. Have you seen, as Energy Commissioner of the EU, have you seen a direct impact on, on the issues which you deal with from this Eurozone crisis? We need um, decisions in next um, weeks before end of the year. And the European Council, which will be held on Friday in Brussels, is very important for to get a package of measures and proposals and getting back the trust um, of the markets, on, of the investors, and more European policy is needed in energy as well. And so I think to Europeanize energy policy is one mid-term and long-term instrument to uh, bring Europe in a better position for investors, for our financial institutions, and for our industry as well. Okay, good to Thank you for your time. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you.
Now, before we leave you this week, just a quick word on this building. I mentioned it at the start of the program, the Qatar National Convention Center, which actually only opened uh, a day before the Congress began. They went pretty close to the wire on that one. Uh, but as you've seen, it's quite an impressive structure. And interesting too, if you look behind me, you can see there on the roof of the main exhibition hall uh, are some solar panels. I say some because there are three and a half thousand square meters of them on top of the building, which provide 12 and a half percent of the building's electricity needs. That mightn't sound a lot, but it is a big building. And certainly while the people inside the building were talking about the future of renewable energies, the owners of the convention center are actually doing it right now. So that is it for this special edition of Counting the Cost. If you want to get in touch with us, please do. Our Twitter and email details are at the bottom of your screen right now. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team here at the World Petroleum Congress in Doha. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.